Uh, if you open your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20. I, I want to continue Pastor Steve's series on God's highways. But I'd like to, I'd like to focus today on embracing God's processes. You know, um, not many months ago, I turned 30, and um, it really hit me. <laughs> I'm telling you, I did not expect this. I don't know if it's psychological, but my back started to hurt. Uh, started to see gray hair. You see this thing on the side, it keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper, <laughs> and, and I am a little afraid. I went into this like week and a half crisis that I, I didn't tell my wife because I didn't want her to enjoy it, <laughs> so I, I kept it to myself, but boy, it was it, I mean, it was like, I don't know how to explain it, it was like, what am I doing with my life? I'm 30 years old. And then my mom called to say happy birthday. And after she said happy birthday, she's like, why are you weight, gaining so much weight? And I said, mom, you know, at this age. <laughs> Plus, you know how many thousands of dollars had been invested here? <laughs> Do you have a clue how much money there is here? But, you know, I said, Mom, this is a 30-year-old belly, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, but I was, it was difficult. I mean, I was, I wanted to gather my kids and bless them one last time. <laughs> Want them to gather them around my bed, you know. Um, I began to talk like this. But in all seriousness, I don't know how to explain it, but there was something that happened when I got to the third floor that um, made me reflect. You know, one of those times where there are, there are like these landmarks. Pastor Doug Stringer has a great message, I think, a couple of years ago about the landmarks in life, right? And sometimes you get to a season and you can just feel that it's the, begin, the end of a season and the beginning of a new season. And I was... I was reflecting on, okay, 30 years old, I got, my wife and I got to Houston when I was 23. We had an interview with Pastor Steve. Um, he did his best to intimidate us <laughs> and scare us. Pastor Stu was there. And I remember finishing the meeting by saying, ah. I told him, you can't be worse than my dad. And, <laughs> He said, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my thing. If you were to ask me today, John, sum up in one message this past, what's almost seven years, it's going to be in February, March, of your life, the season since you got here to Grace Woodlands. By the way, I didn't even have kids now that I think about it. Mia came and Judah, actually, uh, Mia was, because they're only a year apart. We had Mia was a baby and pastors too um, gave us graciously some hotel nights for Disney. And when we got back from Disney, Lydia was pregnant with Judah. So, <laughs> So there goes the magic kingdom. <laughs> so, I think, so I think pastors too should pay for college and all those things. So at least for one of them, because it's your fault. <laughs> if you were to ask me, what have you learned? What is the one thing? If I was supposed to make one last statement at my 30s. If I reflect on what has God taught me, 
What has God shaped in me after seven years? I guarantee you, this is it. So, let's start. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. You there? For since the creation of the world, he is what? Invisible. Invisible. Say with me, invisible. invisible. Invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Go with me to Psalms chapter 19, verse 1. And I'll read it for you real quick. Most of you know it. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Now go with me to what will be our key verse today. Which is Isaiah chapter 45. And we're going to stay here almost the whole message. Verses 15. And we'll read all the way to 19. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in everybody uh, seeing it in your Bibles. And when you're there, you can say amen or, or bingo or whatever you want. Truly, you are God who hide yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also disgraced, all of them. They shall go in confusion together who are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. Verse 18, our key verse today. For thus says the Lord, who what? Say with me, created. Who is God? Who what? Formed. The earth. Who has what? Right. Made it. And then who has established it. Who did not create it in vain. Who formed it to be what? Yeah. I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob seek me in vain. I the Lord speak righteousness. I declare things that are Right. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Reveal Jesus to us. Do what only you can do. Amen. And amen. Let me introduce today by saying that the invisible things are invisible. Isn't that deep? Huh? That was not revealed to me by flesh and blood. Paul, on the first verse in Romans that we were, we were reading, is saying that the power of God, his deity, that means his attributes, the characteristics of God's personality are invisible. Those who want to understand God's character, God's power, God's heart, God's attributes, why does God do what he does and how? Most of the time, it is invisible. I would dare to say all the time. My dad says I shouldn't be dogmatic. But, but God is saying here, if you want to see something invisible, look at the things that have been created. They are contemplating the creation, meaning what God does, the work of his hands. You will begin to see the invisible. Not long ago on a Wednesday, I don't know if you remember, I, gave, uh, I, I shared a message about God's covering of salvation. So he dresses with salvation, uh, uh, the polar bear, so, ha so that he can uh, survive, multiply, be fruitful and thrive in the North Pole. But you take that bear and you put it in the, in the desert, the bear won't make it because it has not been covered. It has not been blessed by God to be in the desert. So God blesses, and you can go ahead and put the camel over there in the, in, the, in the North Pole, and it's the same thing. They have not been blessed, so God blesses us with a cover to thrive, to survive, and to be fruitful in the place which he has put us, in his purposes. So there contemplating the creation, you will begin to perceive the invisible. Remember, Christians are the only ones that can see the invisible. Hebrews 11, 
Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All of his kingdom, his power, visible, but it manifests through the things created. So now that takes us to Isaiah 45. The invisible things of God are revealed through creation. And by the way, what a beautiful day today, isn't it? I was worried none of you would come. <laughs> because in other cities and other states, they are afraid of a bad attendance when there's awful weather. But here in Houston, it's the opposite. When there's a great day, you go, oh, I hope there's people at church today. Because <laughs> we don't get many of those. But um, just like you see in creation, the heart of God is to bless. That's why we're called to bless, not to curse. God always wants to bless. God, he is the God who blesses. So let's go to Isaiah 45, 18. And I'm going to put this one on the screen because we're going to read it so much you'll know it by memory by the end of this message. For thus says the Lord who what? Created. Created. Now we're talking about God's processes here. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, what? The heavens and the earth. Now, before God created the heavens and the earth, did something else exist? No. Because God created everything in him. In him, all of creation actually came out of God himself. Everything was in him. It just was not visible. God created matter, the universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was void and without form. The original word means the earth came to be void and without form. In hilo is the word. Let's put verse 18. For thus says the Lord, who what? Created the heavens, who is God, who what? formed the earth. So this is the second one. In chapter 2, the Bible now tells us the whole process again, but it uses a different language. In chapter 1, God created, but in chapter 2, the Bible uses a different word. God formed. Here's what form means. The original language to form means to give form. Actually, in Hebrew... The original word is potter. The potter is the one who forms, who shapes. So God didn't simply create man, but God formed man in the beginning. God created, but then he formed. What did God make man out of? Dust. But God first created dust, and on the sixth day, God formed, shaped man with something he created on the first day. God creates and then forms. Can you say that with me? God creates, God creates, then forms. A lot of us were saved on a specific day and time, and you still remember that day. Because that day, God made a new creation. God made a new Bob, a new John, a new Lydia, a new Brooke. So we have two birth dates, one here on earth and one in heaven. I mean, you thank God for that. But God, since the day he made you a new creation, God has been forming you. And he's still doing it. He is the creator and he's the one that forms you. The new creation, by the way, is formed into the image of Jesus Christ. That's why any of you want to see how you truly are, read the Gospels. The Old Testament speaks of these two words, the creator and he who forms you. If you go to Isaiah chapter 43 verse 1 says, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name, you are mine. Jacob was a deceiver. I... <laughs> I never, I'm never going to ask, because really I don't care. But <laughs> growing up, my mom would always say, oh, my Jacob, my Jacob. <laughs> and I'm, mom, when have I deceived you? 
God created Jacob, but God began to work Israel, shaping Israel in him. El, El, God, shaping himself in Jacob. Actually, after, after, that, after that encounter that God had with Jacob, God changes his name, Israel, El. El means God, that's why El, Ohim, Ohim means, it's plural, so that's why El, Ohim said, let us make God into our image. So God, God says, Israel, prince of God. Now, that was the destiny that was assigned to, to Jacob a long time ago. God has ble had blessed Jacob when he was in his mother's womb. For some reason, he was a deceiver, a supplanter. He wanted to take his brother's place. And that, my friend, trying to copy and be someone else that God did not create him to be, cost him all the problems in his life. Cost him to constantly be running away. God created the heavens. God created Jacob, but formed Israel, a prince of God. God created the heavens. He formed the earth. This is an attribute of God. This is a characteristic of God. Everything that God creates, he then forms. Amen? Can we put verse 18 again on the screen? For thus says the Lord who? The heavens. Who is God? Who? And made it. God creates. God forms. We're looking at how God does things. The original word for make there, you know what it means? It means to prepare to bear fruit. God creates the earth, he forms man, and then God plants trees in a garden. What for? Was it for decoration? No. So that they can bear fruit. Much fruit. Actually, let me talk a little bit about the Garden of Eden. In the Bible, the kingdom of God was manifested completely in the Garden of Eden. It was actually heaven on earth. That's why they can't find it and they will never find it because he was a manifestation of heaven on earth. God planted a garden of Eden so that everything produces fruit. Actually, there was four rivers. One was named abundance. The other was named prosperity. The other was named velocity. And the fourth one, I don't remember what it was. But one day we'll look, talk about them. Oh, and by the way, the serpent did not appear to Adam and Eve in right in the center of the Garden of Eden in a tree like this. That's, that's a painting for the, from the Middle Age. That's, that's how they portray it. But Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 said that the serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God made. But the devil was not in the garden because the devil cannot be where the manifestation of the kingdom is. In Genesis chapter 1, God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fall of the air, and over everything living thing that moveth upon the earth. When they went out to take authority, they encountered the serpent. Because every time you go and take authority over something in your life, the serpent will show up and try. It's very clever. It will oppose you by sowing doubt into what God has spoken. If you have an addiction, as long as you keep being addicted to whatever you're addicted to, the devil doesn't care. But the moment you say, I'm going to win territory over this issue in my life, the serpent will show up and begin to question what God has spoken. God plants us in his kingdom so that we can be fruitful. He forms you and he makes you so you can bear much fruit. Can we put verse 18 again? For thus says the Lord who what? Who is God who what? And here comes the next one. Who has established it. The word established in the original means to put in order, to assign a destiny to each thing. God establishes us, establishes us. He gives us a composition with talents and resources to live, survive, and bear much fruit. God creates, God forms, 
God makes and God establishes. Actually, in, 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 in a version in Spanish, it reads like this. God gives you a specific composition. Lord, but I wanted to sing. You have, some of you have not been given that composition to sing. <laughs> and if you get up here, you will torture all of us. <laughs> Pastor Josh and I have this ongoing tension because I believe I have given a little bit of composition to sing, but he does not believe in it. <laughs> he doesn't let me sing. I do it anyways in rebellion every now and then. God, when God establishes, he gives you a certain composition. And this, is, this can be translated into the corporate context of the church. God gives each congregation a certain composition. That's why we, don't, we shouldn't try to be some other church. This is who we are. I wish I could be one of those cool pastors with those skinny torn apart jeans. I don't fit. <laughs> I put some on the other day. I was like, oh. <laughs> Plus, I'm already 30. I'm not going to be wearing those things. <laughs> you young kids won't get it. <laughs> this is just not who I am. Oh, you're just like that because you're a grace. No, I'm a grace because I'm like that, maybe. <laughs> it's who we are. We don't try to be anybody else. Right. Embrace your composition. Oh, Embrace it. You can take it to the arena of the nation. God created this nation. He formed it. And he gave it a specific composition to be fruitful and walk in God's purposes. The problem is they keep trying to change it. And they come up with things that is just not who we are. You look at the news, you go, that's not the U.S. Come on. Some things are, it seems like they're embracing Cuba's composition more than America's composition. But I'm not going to go that route. We'll let Pastor Steve do that. <laughs> I'm that uncle that gives chocolate, you know. <laughs> okay. It's okay. It's, it's a good title for a 30-year-old uncle, Uncle John. Signs of destiny. Forms he makes. He gives a specific composition. Embrace the composition that God gave you. Because when God assigns a composition, he also assigns destiny and goals. Can you, can you put verse 18 again? For thus says the Lord who what? Amen. Who is God who what? Amen. And who has? Amen. He who did not create it Amen. in vain. God didn't create us in vain. Vain means confusion. God didn't create us without form. God didn't create us empty. The word literally, if you read that original passage, it says God didn't create us without any value. That's why his word cannot go back void. And he formed it. Can we put verse 18 again? The second part. Oh yeah, no, no that's fine. He formed it to be, at the end of the day, the processes of God in our life have this one goal, to be filled and carriers of the glory of God, which is God himself. Like I said, we're formed into the image of Jesus Christ. Psalms 19.1, we just read, says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handwork. That word declare means describes. The heavens describe the glory of God. Can we put verse 18 again? One last time, I promise. 
but you will not forget this verse after this. For thus says the Lord, who what? Who is God who? And who has? Who did not create it in? But formed it to be? I am the Lord and there's no other. The process of God. So that was the intro. Let me start preaching. That was the introduction. But I'll preach, I'll preach shortly. So I was, as I was thinking about the processes of God and reflecting on 30 years, especially, um, especially this past almost seven years, after hitting a lot of walls and some mistakes that I would, wouldn't want to ever talk about, after hurting some people, and reacting in impulsiveness and all those mistakes. I look back and I wonder, why do we sometimes make decisions without considering our identity and what God is doing with us? Why do we sometimes make decisions that do not align with the will of God for our lives? Why do we make decisions that are not according to God's order? Again, this could be personal and as a nation. And here's the word for today. It's a very simple word. But this is the lesson that describes the past seven years of my life here at Grace Woodlands. Why am I sharing that? Well, because you're my family. I don't want to share a sermon. I want to share from my heart. And here's the thing. We tend to focus on single events in our lives and not in processes. An event is a point, an instant, a moment. And sometimes we see the event, but we do not see the whole process. We do not consider God's attributes. So we go, I don't feel good today. Have you heard that one? Feel, feel, it's about how I feel. Oh, I don't feel like it. I'm discouraged today. Especially those young millennials. <laughs> they need encouragement all the time. I'm discouraged. Give me a latte. <laughs> As you know, I do not consider myself a millennial. <laughs> Pastor Josh is, I'm not. But what about when you have to make a decision and all you feel is the pressure of the moment and the burden and that's all you can see? And we start considering our lives best based on one day. When events in our life are meant to strengthen our faith so that we know that God is taking us towards a destiny and a purpose. Listen, my friends, listen, church, do not let an event define your purpose. Do not let an event prophesy your future. Because when we look only at a single event, we tend to begin to murmur. Murmuring is the language of unbelief. Praise is the language of faith. And patience is the demonstration of faith. Romans 8, 28, you all know this one. For God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You know what that... Um, the, the word there is cooperate to advance the purpose. Actually, if you look at the definition, you know what it means? It means that all things, meaning thing one, thing two, thing three, thing four, they call for a meeting, all things. They call for a meeting and they ask, thing one, thing two, thing three, what are you going to do to cooperate with John so he can fulfill his God-given destiny. That's what it means. 
All things work together. All things work together according to his purpose. That word purpose, you know what it means? His process. According to his process. And what happens is, and I struggled with this so much, the biggest temptation when someone is looking at single events and is not understanding the processes of God is to automatically do something. We got to do something. What are you going to do about it? Husbands, have your wives ever told you, do something? (laughs) Do something, do something. I remember I was 12 years old. My dad was a local pastor, quite a large church in Mexico. And they called for like what it would be for us, a serve day, hundreds of people. But they were working on the building, making the building look good because we had a conference. There was hundreds of people. Everybody was running around. And my dad, it was a Saturday. He took me to the church so I could help. The problem is I went around every station that they were working on and nobody wanted my help. I was 12 years old. I said, hey, can I help? No, we got it, buddy. Okay. So I went to this other one. Can I help? No, we got it, buddy. Okay. So I get so when my dad comes out, he sees me like this, right? But it's just... What are you doing? Everybody's working. You're just standing there doing nothing. I said, Dad, no one wants my help. Oh, yeah, really? No one wants your help. Well, I don't care. I need you to move. (laughs) What do you mean? Yeah, move. I don't want to see you standing. At least move. But what do you mean? Just move. Like now? Now! So I started Did you not? <laughs> but now that I'm 30, I thank God <laughs> for those lessons. You got to do something. You have to do something. What are we going to do? And let me start preaching Abraham and Sarah. God promises a son of their own loins. By the way, before we get into Sarah, I was 23 years old, and one of the first things that Pastor Stu Johnson, the director of our church association, executive director, sat me in his office one day and said, John, I see you like to charge hills. Now, you're always looking a hill to charge. But I want to tell you, make sure you don't charge the wrong hill. I understand it now. I had no clue what you said, when, what you meant back then. <laughs> but now that I think about it, I see what you were saying. God promised Abraham and Sarah, son of their own loins, 73 years old. Nothing happened. One day his wife looked at him and said, Abraham, do something. <laughs> what are you going to do, Abraham? You have to do something. He looked at his own body and he was getting older and older. So he did something, and out of that something, a kid named Ishmael was born. After having Ishmael, God did not speak to him for 13 years. When he was 99 and his wife was 98, God spoke to them and said, I am the Shaddai, I am the one that is more than enough. He was 99, and God said, I will fulfill what I promised, and Sarah left. Here's the thing, in 13 years, the events changed, but the process was the same. When we start looking at single events in our lives, we get confused. And we begin to do things. And do, and do, we got to do. And sometimes we just make it worse. I got to call this person. I'm going to get alone. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get ahead of this. I'm going to get ahead of that. And let me be clear. When we begin to just do because we got to do something, you do not stop God's purposes. You're not that powerful. Who do you think you are? You're going to stop God's purposes, really? But what will happen is that you will begin 
to contemplate. You're going to begin to contemplate the circumstances and you won't see what God is doing and you'll get confused. You begin to walk in confusion. Because you're basing all of your energy, your focus, and, and, and your decision and your heart and your attitude in a single event. You know how many people are not growing in the Lord because they got stuck in a single event in their lives. And you go, how many years it's going to be, brother, till you get over this? Happened to me. Most horrible things in my life. I had to eventually say, this is part of a process. I'm going to move on. And I tell you something. I am not the same person I was even three years ago. My wife can testify to that. Come on, say yes. Come on. <laughs> Let's all get up. How about that? Stand. Not a conventional way to call the. Let me read to you. Actually, let's put verse 18 again, please. One last time, one last time. <laughs> For thus says the Lord, who what? Is. Who is God, who what? Is. And is. who has? Is. Who did not create it in? But formed it to be, I am the Lord and there's no other. Thank you, Jesus, for your process in our lives. And we looked at the, at the example of Sarah. But just in, in, in this chapter 45, if you read, and I'm going to read it to you. Uh, if you go to the first verses, which give you the context, it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and lose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness. And hidden reaches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who called you, I am the Lord who called you by your name. Listen to this. Thus says the Lord, these were, these were words prophesied by Isaiah and 120 years later, the tribe of Judah is taken to Babylon. 50 years in Babylon. And the Babylon began to weaken. And the Persian army began to strengthen. Cyrus was the emperor. Cyrus didn't know much about this. But eventually the Persians attacked Babylon. Babylon had a lot of slaves. In, this, in the midst of these slaves were the whole people of Judah and Benjamin actually. And Cyrus attacks Babylon. And he conquers it breaking the locks. Just like Isaiah prophesied 120 years before. Just like that. They came under the river Euphrates. 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 If I have another kid, I'm going to name him that. Euphrates Mansewich. Poor kid. <laughs> Never mind. It's going to be so bullied by, my, by me. They come under the river. And the under the river there were locks. Under the water. 
So they broke the, the, the locks under the water and they came into the city and they conquered the king of Babylon exactly like Isaiah had prophesied 120 years before. When Israel is taken to Babylon and later they're taken to Persia, Daniel, the prime minister, he knew, Daniel knew one thing, heaven rules. Heaven has the last word because God shapes, he creates, he forms, he makes, he establishes in our lives. And Daniel was taken as a kid in Babylon. But you know what? Daniel had this prophecy in his hand. And he goes up to King Cyrus and says, I want to tell you and I want to show you what God has said about you 120 years ago. You have been chosen. You have been anointed by God. And King Cyrus, who was not, who was not a priest, let me tell you that. King Cyrus said, if that God knew me 120 years before and has anointed me, I want you to go back to that God. And he blesses the people of Israel more than any king besides Solomon and David. Now here's the thing. When there was a change of administration and King Cyrus barely starts coming in, the people of Israel, you know what they did? They started murmuring. Here we go again. Now another boss. Which one's worst? We hope this one is not worse than the other one. I wonder what they're going to make us do now. Little did they know that the single event was just part of the process of deliverance and destiny that God had for his people. Because he creates, he forms he prepares you to bear fruit. He establishes you to be inhabited by the glory and the presence of God. This is the God of processes. Embrace the process. Embrace the composition God has given you. And walk in understanding of God's processes. Do not let single events prophesy your future. Do not let single events declare your destiny. And I've come to this conclusion after long 30 years <laughs> and a lot of wisdom gained. I use glasses now. Use glasses. Are they for reading? Yes. And for eating? <laughs> and for walking? And driving I realized this the main characteristic of a true man of God is he understands the kairos the process that we're in and he responds accordingly and surrenders to the ways of God Moses said God Show me your ways. Oh, a lot of people want the cloud of glory. Some want the column of fire and the power and the signs and the wonders. My prayer, looking back today, is, Lord, show me your ways. I want to walk them. I want to embrace your processes. I want to walk in your destiny. I surrender to you, Lord. Embrace God's processes. Here's what I think. I can imagine Daniel walking with the prophecy in his hands. Walking towards King Cyrus. And there's a mess. Even the angel complained. He's like, man, you started praying. Now we have a war up here. There's a mess in the nation. Everybody's confused. Babylon means confusion. It's a place of confusion. Yet Daniel knew that knew that knew that God has the last word. I can imagine him walking with the prophecy towards Cyrus, looking at the mess and going, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. 
You never, I'm singing, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, he's still working. Even when your bank account doesn't show it, he's still working. No matter what the doctor says, you never stop. You never stop working. Oh, and I can't imagine him watching God break the locks under the river, ready for enter it, to enter into their deliverance. And I wonder if they said, Haha, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper. Yes, 120 years ago, He promised. And He's keeping His word. And He's keeping His word. I wonder if Sarah, when she's 98, and she looks like, ¿cómo se dice pasa de uva en inglés? And her body looks like a raisin. <laughs> Thank you. And her body looks like a raisin, and God says, I'm going to give you a kid. She laughed. I wonder if she said, <laughs> even I look like a raisin, you're working. <laughs> even if I'm old, you're working. Because you never stop. You never stop. You never stop working. Hallelujah.